Now that we understand the concept of osmosis, now let's check out the idea or the actual application of reverse osmosis. As you can imagine, reverse osmosis has its application, especially because the idea or the general idea of cleaning the solvent typically will be water. So imagine the power of cleaning water, or removing ions or unwanted ions from water. That's powerful. Let me read this. Refers to the passage of a solvent, which is actually not limited only to water, but of course water is one of the most common used solvents, through a membrane that is much more permeable to the solvent, in this case water, than to all the other solids. Let it be inorganic ions, organic material, dissolved uh, particles, and so on. As you can imagine, it is the reverse process than osmosis. So in osmosis, typically, the solvent will move towards the high concentration. And in this specific case, the solvent will go from high concentration to low concentration. And as you can imagine, uh, if we want to revert or go to the reverse of entropy, we will need to apply external work, and actually a lot of it. This work typically comes in the form of a pressure gradient, meaning that we are pressurizing the feed in order to pass through the uh, membrane. Now let us check out this little diagram. We have three main conditions in which P1 and 2 are the same. P1 and 2 are different, or the difference on height is due to the uh, osmotic pressure. And we got P1 and 2, which is uh, the reverse. The osmotic pressure is reversed. So initial condition A, let it be this one right here. Sea water, and we select sea water because it has a lot of ions, but still we were working with water. So it has 3.5% by weight dissolved salts. Let it be sodium, chloride, carbonate, magnesium, calcium, etc. Add one uh, one atmosphere or 101.3 kilopascals. Pure water at the same pressure is in the right side. So this is cell number one, cell number two, or let it be left side and right side. The dense membrane is permeable to water, but not to the dissolved salts. By osmosis, water passes from cell two to the sea water in cell one, causing dilution of the dissolved salts. Now, why does this happen? Because we have pure water, which probably has 0% of salt. And we have seawater, which has 3.5%. Remember that according to natural osmosis, what's going to happen is that because the ions cannot distribute evenly, solvent will be the one moving because it's the only one permeable. The main idea is that it moves to the left. It will increase the level and we'll try to get something in between 0 and 3.5%. By osmosis, water passes from cell 2 to the seawater in cell 1, causing dilution of the dissolved salts. Transport of solvent in the opposite direction is effect by imposing a pressure on the feed. It must be higher than the osmotic pressure, so that's obviously and pretty straightforward. If the pressure is not good enough, you will not be able to reverse this process. Using a known porous membrane, reverse osmosis will be able to dissolve brackish water commercially. Reverse osmosis affects separation of very small solids, such as salts with ionic gravity smaller than even the range of sodium, 4 to 8 angstroms in range. The solids will move through the membrane mainly under the concentration gradient forces. The solvent transport is dependent on the hydraulic pressure gradient. So uh, even though it is based on the concentration, it is actually based on the pressure you are applying. Pores in reverse osmosis membranes are so small, they have not yet been resolved. Even by the most advanced microscopic techniques are still hard to get, but make no worries, it will eventually occur. Technology is so crazy, human race is always pushing and pushing. At equilibrium, the condition of beam is rich. So remember that this was before, and if we let this and uh, let time pass, we will achieve condition B. Where in some pure water still resides on cell two and sea water. So you have, let's say, a difference on concentrations, but essentially uh, we have less 
concentration here. So this is less than 3.5. And pressure 1 in cell 1 is now greater than pressure 2 in cell 2. So if you were to calculate the pressure, guys, as you can imagine, well, this difference on height will be the difference of pressure, of course. Os osmosis is not a useful separation process because the solvent is transferred in the wrong direction. Of course, guys, if the main idea is to purify water, we are adding pure water and we are ending up with uh, less pure water. However, the direction of transport of solvent through the membrane can and will be reversed for our convenience. If we apply the pressure required, guys, in P1, uh, that is higher than the sum of the osmotic pressure and the actual pressure, we will be able to counterbalance this. Now, water in the sea salt is transferred to the pure water. So essentially what's happening here, guys, is we got some ionic salts, ionic ions, which comes from salt. What we're doing is we are going to pressure so hard and we know that ions will not be able to pass through here. So the solvent is going to move. This phenomena is called reverse osmosis. It's used to partially remove solvents from the solid solvent mix. So by applying an external force, we are able to clean or filter this water. An important factor in developing a reverse osmosis separation process is the osmotic pressure of the feed, which is proportional to the solid concentration. And that's very uh, straightforward. Is given as follows pi or pressure osmotic pressure equals the molarity which is technically the concentration times the temperature and the ideal gas constant and as you can imagine guys for pure water which has no concentration of ions well the pressure will be zero that's our standard of course if we have pure water on the left side and the right side the change in pressure should be zero reverse osmosis from now on ro performs a separation without a phase change which we have been telling this about on the advantages that we are not changing the composition or not we are in fact changing the composition sorry we are not changing the phase which will be the typical case for evaporation of seal water so you evaporate the water you condense the water and all the salts removed are left behind as solids thus the energy requirements are very very low compared to that still important for the pressure applications our all systems are compact and space requirements are less than with other desalting systems so actually not only dependent on the uh, sizing but reverse osmosis is by far one of the top uh, methodologies to continue for purifying or cleaning water RO equipment are pretty standard you will typically see a pump system several motors common valving flow meters pressure change gauges controlling systems and so on it's very straightforward guys it's pretty similar like a heat exchanger with a shell and tube uh, setting you already know that well uh, certain fluid will go outside certain fluid will go inside and you just need to work through the uh, equipment it's very straightforward it's very standard thus the learning curve for a unskilled labor is short and I don't like that much the word labor, but still, yeah, the uh, learning curve of a engineer working with this or a operator working with this is pretty straightforward. Actually, you can see very lots of relationships, the application, flow rates, concentration. The applied pressure must exceed the osmotic pressure to obtain the product flow and to separate the solute from the solvent. Well, this is pretty straightforward for me, guys. The applied pressure gotta be always greater than the osmotic pressure. The maximum feed pressure of seawater devices will vary a lot. Actually, you can have from 800 to 1000 PSI. The limit of brackish water varies from 400 to 600. So it's very hard to say, well, this is the amount of pressure you should be operating. RO is usually not applicable for concentrated solutions due to the high pressure requirements. I don't know if you remember, but we were talking about seawater, which is about 3 to 0.5 uh, in concentration, something around 
10% or maybe 30% will be requiring lots of pressure, maybe even impossible pressures to achieve. So this is one of the disadvantages of reverse osmosis. All aromembranes and devices are susceptible to falling. Well, that's very obvious. If you have some sand or any particulate which is greater than the ions, they will eventually start uh, falling or depositing in the membrane. RO process usually cannot be applied without pretreatment due to falling. So what I'm talking here is that you gotta pretreat the sea water before you can actually send the, let's say, the treated uh, seawater to the unit operation. RO feed streams must be compatible with the membrane and other materials of construction used in the device. Well, this is also technicalities. The important part right here will be falling and pretreatment for falling. I don't want to get that technical into calculations, but let's check out a little bit on the type of calculation that you will carry on whenever talking about reverse osmosis. So typically it involves two main uh, components, the water and the salts. The water flux permeates the reverse osmosis membrane according to the following equation. And well, as you can imagine, the difference in pressure will always depend whether or not it is greater than the actual osmotic pressure. The salt flux across the reverse osmosis membrane is given as follows. So this is not the reverse guys. Do not assume that the negative of JB equals JA. This is based on the salt. And salt permeability, salt concentration in the feed, and salt concentration in the permeate. Even though you can do a balance also on the retentate, it is likely to be done in the permeate. The salt concentration on the permeate side is usually very small compared to the feed side. So expect that the change in concentration will be considerably high. Membrane selectivity increases as the pressure increases. Well, that's pretty straightforward, guys. More pressure, you will be able to operate at better conditions. Selectivity can be measured in a number of ways, but the typical way we do this, or the conventional way, it is by the measurement as the salt rejection coefficient, which I don't want to get that much into this because we are not going to operate a salt, uh, the salting system, sorry. And these are the type of equipments you will encounter. These are the so-called membranes that are used on the reverse osmosis. You have the inlet, which is the tube, and you can see how water goes from out into the desalted material. So this is the desalted water, and water goes out. The salt water goes in, and the ions remain on the membranes. Eventually, what you want to do is remove the retentate, which is, yeah, it's right here. This little, let's say, hollow tube will have the concentrate, which is, of course, at higher concentrations. Remember, guys, that this is nothing more than you have the original feed passes through the membrane, and you have your permeate, which is low in concentration of salts, and you have the retentate, which is high in concentration of salts. And these are the equipment. I already show you some of them. As you can imagine, these are not that big systems, rather a repetition of unit operations. And this is what we're going to encounter a lot in membrane technology, that there are a lot of cartridges system or piping system, but you don't have like a huge pipe. You are not going to encounter a huge tower for reverse osmosis. Rather, you're going to have a lot of pipes a lot of unit operations that carry on those membranes. And we have been talking about the salinization of brackish water, but actually there are many other applications on reverse osmosis. Treatment of wastewater to remove impurities, treatment of surface and groundwater, concentration of foodstuff, and removal of alcohol from beers, wines, spirits, and so on. 